Lethal Company version 50 is finally here with some all new moons, new lore, and a new most dangerous enemy in the game. You all already know what I'm talking about. It's those birds! I'm telling you, they're a menace! Those things won't leave me alone! No, no, I don't care that they're technically lizards, alright? I hate them! I hate them! I swear, they fly through the walls of the ship, they carry me into the sky to feed their young, and they never go for anyone else! I mean, Richard is standing right there! They're always coming for me! But above all, I think the thing that's intrigued people the most is the new intro cutscene which shows someone working at a facility unlike anything we've seen in the game. An alarm starts going off, we hear coil heads and nutcrackers and people screaming in the background, and then the G-Man shows up at the last second. What? Now you know me, I'm not usually a lore kind of guy. But I'll admit, this had my interest peaked, and according to a poll I ran in my community tab, so did all of you. And by the way, if you want to see more polls and stuff like this in the future, then hit that subscribe button down below. Oh no, it's another bird! In order to find out exactly what's going on here, I decided to dig a little deeper into this game's lore, and what I found was a deep history, far more complex than anyone has realized. If you thought Lethal Company was just the story of a corrupt corporation trying to feed a space monster, buckle up. This is the real story of Lethal Company. Richard, hit that intro. For anyone who somehow found this video but doesn't already know, in Lethal Company, you and up to three friends work as scrappers for the company. Your job is to fly out to abandoned factories and manor houses on far-flung moons in the fictional Thistle Nebula. You have three days to collect as much scrap as you can, at which point you're flown back to the company building to sell all your stuff to the mystery man behind the wall. If you meet your quota for that period, that's great! Now here's a new higher quota and three more days. Now get back to work! But if you fail to meet that quota, well then, the company would like to wish you the best of luck in your future endeavors. The terminal on your ship tells us that this game is set in the year 2532. However, the real story begins much, much earlier. Scattered across the various moons are data logs containing diary entries of a man named Sigurd, who worked for the very same company as you from August to October of 1968. Now, it's important to note that Lethal Company does not take place in our world, so their 1968 is not equivalent to our 1968. Still, this means that folks have been going out gathering junk for the company for well over 500 years. Sigurd is the documentarian of his crew, leaving records of their outings and taking notes on the monsters they encounter. Making up the rest of his crew is Desmond, who's good with technology, Jess, who we never really learn much about, and Richard, whose one defining characteristic is that he smells bad! <laughs> it's literally the only thing we ever learned, and they mentioned it like nine times! It's true, it's true, you do smell bad. And then he dies! <laughs> Sigurd's experiences seem to be remarkably similar to our own, despite being half a millennia apart. They go out to the same abandoned facilities, encounter the same entities, get instructions from the same robotic voice, and collect the same types of scrap. Most of these entries are just Sigurd complaining about his job and his crewmates, and honestly, fair enough. I work with a smelly guy named Richard too, it's pretty rough. That's probably why the birds never go for him. However, as this crew gets deeper into their contract, things get a little strange. In the fourth log, Golden Planet, Sigurd casually mentions that he can hear the sounds of people screaming on the other side of the company building wall. Which, you know, 
It's not a great sign. Eventually, he manages to contact one of these voices on his walkie-talkie, and the man inside tells Sigurd a very bizarre story. Apparently, the company itself is not in the building that we visit like the crew is led to believe. Instead, it's a prison for a massive beast that ate an entire planet made of gold along with everyone on it. The real role of the Scrappers isn't to collect materials for the company, it's to keep the beast fed. Great, so Lethal Company is just a big company conspiracy to keep a planet-eating monster from getting too hangry and eating more planets. Story done, simple as that. Except, clearly, that's not the full story. These logs tell us a lot about what the Thistle Nebula was like in 1968, but to know how we got to this point, we have to turn our attention to the bestiary. Whenever you scan an enemy, you get a little data entry on your computer with some information about their biology and their behavior. Some of these entries are just simple fun facts about the enemies and tips on how to avoid them, but others reveal a staggering amount of history to this world from even before Sigurd's time. The bestiary for the Bunker Spider makes passing reference to a ship known as the Boat, which apparently circumnavigated the Thistle Nebula several hundred years ago. Apparently this boat housed many different animal species that were inadvertently exposed to high levels of radiation. This caused them to undergo rapid evolutionary growth. Mostly, things got a lot bigger. Baboon hawks are apparently evolved from modern-day monkeys, cartilaginous fish became thumpers, and the flying tulip snakes evolved from literal Satan himself. So extrapolating on this information a little, we know it took several hundred years for these creatures to evolve. And we know that Sigurd and his crew encountered many of these evolved creatures in 1968. That means that the boat would have had to complete its circumnavigation of the nebula somewhere between 16 to 1700. This rapid evolutionary growth can explain most of the enemies in the game, but not all. There are a few entities that appear far less biological and much more mechanical. The entry for the coil head, as an example, speculates that it is a biological weapon of war, though they're not able to determine who made them or how exactly they work because they self-destruct whenever you try to take them apart. Before this most recent update, the popular theory was that the company itself started out as a weapons manufacturer. They started by making simple mines and turrets, then graduated into biological warfare with the coil heads and the nutcrackers. In their pursuit of creating more and more powerful weapons, they eventually created the beast behind the wall. But it was far too powerful for even them to control. It ate the golden planet, and everything fell apart. A great war broke out, the company's weapons ravaged the facilities on these moons, everything was abandoned, and now they're scrambling to clean up the mess. However, looking more closely, this doesn't seem to be true. Or at least, it's not the full story. Nearly all the bestiary entries contain a danger rating from Sigurd himself, along with his own little tips and observations. Now, it's worth mentioning that his observations aren't always the most scientifically accurate. It seems he forgot a couple zeros on the danger rating for the birds, but this still gives us some helpful timeline information. The fact that Sigurd is able to comment on things like coil heads and jesters tells us that they were invented sometime before 1968. He couldn't give something a danger rating if he never saw one. We know for a fact that it's Sigurd himself who's personally doing these ratings, and not just some scale named after him or something, because of the entry for one of the new enemies, the Old Bird. This bestiary entry is long, and it details the entire 200 plus year history of these things. Their tech is similar to that of ships from the year 2130, and their first ever recorded appearance was in 2143 when they were used to invade the capital of the Anglin Empire, a fictional place that is literally never mentioned anywhere else in the game. 
Nobody knows who made them, but we can infer that they were built on the moon Artifice and tested on Embryon, two moons which, oddly enough, have been purged from the company's computers. Why do I bring this enemy up? Well, if these things weren't made until 2130, then Sigurd would have been long dead, and would have never had the chance to encounter one. And sure enough, in the beta, this entry did include a danger rating and a little quip from Sigurd at the end, but these were since removed, likely because they didn't make any timeline sense. All the other danger ratings have been left in though, implying that they were intended to predate Sigurd. The existence of the old birds as a newer creation sort of recontextualizes the way that we should look at the Lethal Company universe. Before this update, it was easy to imagine this timeline as split into two distinct ages. First, the world was great, all the moons were thriving, and then the beast showed up, wars broke out, and all the moons were abandoned. And now, we're living in the post-apocalypse of that world. But now it's clear that this descent has been far more gradual. From Sigurd's logs, we know that moons like Val were already abandoned prior to 1968, but Titan is still fully populated. Sigurd's dad lived there, and he mentioned that there were rumors of war coming soon. And we know that long after Sigurd's time, new empires were still able to rise and fall, new weaponry was developed, new songs were created. And so, this appears to be the rough timeline of Lethal Company's world. Sometime around 16 to 1700, a ship known as The Boat completed a voyage around the Thistle Nebula. What that ship was, or the purpose of his voyage, is a topic for another day. But we do know that many of the animals on board experienced rapid evolutionary changes due to the increased radiation. We also know that around this time, mechanical weapons of war were built. Wars were fought on various moons, causing them to be abandoned, and the company trapped the beast that ate an entire golden planet. Whether that beast was a weapon of their own creation or something else entirely, we can't say for sure. Though the fact that they're so secretive about it and their scrapper's true purpose isn't a great sign. After that, Sigurd and his crew have their adventures in 1968 and try to expose the company, but seemingly fail, for it's still going strong 500 years later. In that time, empires rise and fall, new weapons like the old birds are created, and all the while the company is still sending scrappers out to feed the insatiable beast they have locked behind a mile of concrete. Great, that's all super interesting. Now what the hell does any of that have to do with the G-Man? Well, kind of a lot actually. Knowing what we know now about the history of this universe, let's look back at that scene a bit more closely. We see someone sitting at their desk with a deactivated coil head visible through the window. The building starts to shake, the coil head activates, we hear screaming, the sound of the coil head spring, a nutcracker fires, and then the shadowy man appears. Now, most people assume that the company itself is the one who built all the mechanical entities. But just like how the history of this world and its slow deterioration is a lot more complicated than we originally thought, I think this fact too isn't quite so cut and dry. For proof, let's take a closer look at the entries for these mechanical enemies, specifically the Nutcracker, Coilhead, Jester, and Old Bird. The entries for the Coilhead and Old Bird are very long, and they contain a lot of details about their capabilities, strengths, and weaknesses. They almost read like research papers, like the company is trying to take them apart to see how they work. The entry for the Coilhead specifically bemoans the fact that they are nearly impossible to study because they self-destruct whenever you try to take one apart. This is only the kind of feature you would learn about if you tried to take one apart. In both these cases, it's pretty clear that the company doesn't know exactly how they work or who made them, but they'd like to know. Uh, granted, they could simply be playing dumb so you don't realize that your employer made the murderous robot trying to kill you. However, the other two mechanical entities have 
very different bestiaries. The Nutcracker's entry is the shortest in the game by a lot. It simply reads, The Guardians of the House. They watch with one tireless eye, which only senses movement. It remembers the last creature it noticed, whether they're moving or not. That's it. No exhaustive history, no detailed analysis, just that. To me, it reads almost like an advertisement. Get your very own Nutcracker today. Guardian of the house can always remember the last intruder it saw. It's got a big old gun and it can blast those birds away. Bye now, before time runs out. And then there's the Jester. This entry is interesting because, well, there is no entry. Instead, we get a message from Sigurd himself, who has some very insightful observations, and I quote, <clears throat> There is no scientific record! The company is very forthright with information regarding the coil heads and the old bird, but super cagey with the Nutcracker and Jester. Why? Well, maybe because the company didn't make the coil heads or the old birds. They are perfectly fine spilling any and all secrets they have on their competitors' creations, but when it comes to their own, well, that's proprietary information right there. Also, an interesting tidbit, the Nutcracker and Jester are both based on toys, which could suggest that they're made by the same company, but the other two are not. Based on this, it's my theory that the company isn't the only weapons manufacturer out there, but rather one of many. After all, in order for a war to break out, there needs to be two sides. So knowing this, let's take an even closer look at that intro cutscene. The computer on the desk shows the same interface that pops up when you boot up the game, implying that this person works for the company. We see a coil head deactivated in the back, and we know from the bestiary entry that the company has done some hands-on research on coil heads, so this is likely one such facility where they're performing that research. When the alarm goes off, we see the monitor read, detecting difficulties, running reboot diagnostics. So it seems like someone is hacking into the company computer, which could be what reactivates the coil head. It runs off into the hall, and we hear the sound of its spring in the distance, specifically the sound that it plays when you look at one to freeze it. And not the sound that plays when it kills someone. We then hear the sound of the Nutcracker's gun. Previously, we assumed that the Nutcracker and Coilhead were allies, causing mayhem and attacking employees together. But if they were made by rival companies, then perhaps it was the Nutcracker who stopped the Coilhead. We know that it can detect movement, and it can remember its location after it stops moving and they are described as the guardians of the house, after all. I believe this cutscene is showing us one such example of how the facilities we'll be exploring were abandoned. It's showing us exactly how this world came to be and the types of wars that were fought. And yet, there remains one final question. Who the heck is the shadowy man that appears at the end? Frankly, there's not enough information in the game yet to say for sure, but I can think of two likely possibilities. A lot of people have been referring to this man as the CEO, the boss of the company. But if these scenes show an attack on a company office, then that doesn't make any sense. Why would a CEO attack his own building? Instead, it could be someone who works for the rival company come to collect their stolen coil head. Or perhaps it could be a third party entirely. After all, there are still many mysteries of this world. References to native populations on various moons that have vanished without a trace. Pikes with the heads of former company employees that can randomly appear. Or the orange graffiti in a locked cabin trying to expose the secrets of the old birds. And the drill below the company building poised to smash through the wall and free the beast within. If we've learned anything today, it's that this world is far more complicated than it seems. There are rival factions, warring empires,
corporate espionage and planet-destroying monsters. But hey, you don't have to worry about any of that. You just get out there and get as much scrap as you can. Good luck, employee. No, wait, no, the birds are back. Uh, okay, employee, new mission, rescue me. This video was made possible by all my patrons, including Alakazam, Aspa102, Big Dog Tie for the Win, Sidian, Sherry and Mark, The Boss Killer94, and Alberung Freud and Selican. You guys are the greatest. <laughs>